Hello and welcome. It's 10 a.m. on Monday, the 3rd of November. You're tuned in to our mid-morning newscast here on Arirang TV. It's great that you could join us. I'm Mark Broom and let's take a look at what's making the headlines. North Korea has reportedly launched a new submarine capable of firing ballistic missiles, but officials in Seoul say Pyongyang has not yet acquired the technology to deploy the missiles. The families of the victims of April's Sewolho ferry disaster say they are not opposed to the recent political agreement on bills related to the sinking after the deal gave them more of a say on who will participate in the investigation. Plus, the UN body on climate change says no, fossil fuels should be phased out by the year 2100. If not, the world will face severe and irreversible damage. Our top story this morning. It has emerged that North Korea has a new piece of military hardware that could spell trouble for the region. Military and government sources here in Seoul says say North Korea has launched a new submarine that is capable of firing ballistic missiles. Our Connie Kim starts us off. In what appears to be a new threat from North Korea, Pyongyang has reportedly launched a new submarine capable of firing ballistic missiles. Government and military sources in South Korea say Pyongyang has imported a Soviet-era golf-class diesel submarine built in the 50s and modified it. Sources say the newly launched vessel is identical to an unidentified submarine at the Shimpo shipyard that the U.S.-based website 38 North revealed last month. The new vessel is estimated to be 67 meters long, 6.6 .6 meters wide, and has a dive displacement in the 3,000-ton range. Adding to the concern about the new submarine is the operation of a test facility at the Shimpo shipyard that 38 North reported in October. It was reported the North has carried out dozens of tests on the ground and at sea to mount a missile tube on the vessel. A military source in Seoul says Pyongyang's new submarine will pose a threat if the North completes testing for a vertical launch of missiles, estimated to take two years at most. To counter the threat, South Korea plans to launch three 3,000-ton submarines with vertical missile launch tubes by 2020 and an additional three by 2030. Connie Kim, Arirang News. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has praised China for doing more to pressure North Korea these days. Speaking on Bloomberg News, Kerry has said the Chinese were being helpful by taking measures way beyond what they were doing uh, even a year ago. He cited the examples of China reducing the amount of jet fuel uh, going into the country and limitations on trade with the North. Kerry also pointed out that Chinese President Xi Jinping has held five or six meetings with South Korean President Park Geun-hye, but none with Kim Jong-un. The top U.S. diplomat also said Washington is as keen as Beijing to restart the long-stalled six-party talks on the North's denuclearization, but he stressed the U.S. needs assurances Pyongyang is prepared to discuss giving up its nuclear ambitions. Now, despite recent ruptures in inter-Korean relations in recent weeks and months, German lawmaker Hartmut Korshik, who is a long-term advocate for Korean unification, says North Korea wants to talk to South Korea. Now, Korshik was in Pyongyang for about six days recently, and he held talks with the chairman of the Supreme People's Assembly and also uh, the North Korean vice foreign minister. This all before his visit to Seoul last week, which is when Ao Hwang Sang-hee sat down with him for a chat. When you talked to North Korean officials during your stay there, what did they say about inter-Korean relations? Many of the North Korean officials I spoke with were very clear. North Korea hopes to improve relations with South Korea. The attendance of three high-level officials at the closing ceremony of the Asian Games shows this very well. They said rebuilding trust is the most important step for improving South-North relations. As the basis for trust building, they referred to former South Korean President Kim Dae-jung's visit to North Korea in 2000 and the June 15th joint statement that followed. There are speculations about the regime instability in North Korea. What was your impression? 
Of course, Kim Jong-un's power cannot be compared to that of his father, Kim Jong-il, in his prime, but he has enough leverage to control the current situation. The power is not held solely by him, though it is divided among other agents, such as the party, the military, or the economic bodies. But Kim is able to maintain a balance among them. However, I do see a need for a policy to promote overall stability. So before your visit to Pyongyang, you also visited China and you met with officials there. Did you have any talks about North Korea with them? There are tensions between North Korea and China. China wants North Korea to return to the six-party framework and to pursue more reform measures on its own. But at the same time, its biggest interest is securing stability in North Korea and on the Korean Peninsula. Therefore, Beijing is not opposed to Pyongyang's relations with Europe and Berlin. And China believes its friendship with South Korea is helpful in maintaining stability on the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. You've been a longtime advocate of the unification of the two Koreas. Uh, in your view, what's the biggest hurdle to the Korean unification, and how do we make that leap? The challenge can be largely divided into two. First is solving the dire humanitarian situation in North Korea. The second, and the most important and difficult task, is North Korea's nuclear program. The neighboring countries must also be considered. The fundamental step is resolving tensions between the two Koreas, but at the same time, seeking understanding from the United States, China, and Japan remains a challenge. And where does Germany come in? Germany will not be a mediator, it will also not be a master that can offer a great deal of knowledge. But what we can do is to give little bits of advice based on our own experience with unification. Thank you, Mr. Koshik, for your time today. It was a pleasure for me. <laughs> now, the, uh, the families of the victims of April's ferry disaster have decided not to reject an agreement on the three bills related to the sinking that were reached late last week after months and months of bitter political wrangling. The families met on Sunday evening to discuss the deal, saying afterwards that they respected the arduous process by which the agreement was reached. They, however, added that they can't fully accept the bills and made some suggestions for improving them. The bills give the families a much greater say in selecting investigators for the case, among a number of other things. The ferry sinking left over 300 people, mostly high school students, dead or missing. Now, Japanese nationalism has been gaining quite a head of steam in recent years and the ruling Abe administration over there in Japan, while reacting very quickly to uh, ensure a somewhat distorted view of history, has been dragging its feet about clamping down on hate rallies, which includes a great deal of hostility against ethnic Koreans living uh, over there in Japan. And in an attempt to counter the mood, hundreds of citizens took to the streets of Tokyo on Sunday to protest against racial discrimination. Now, Son Jung-in reports. Around 1,000 people from different ethnic backgrounds gathered on Sunday to march against the hate speech at a rally in Tokyo's bustling Shinjuku district. The participants wanted to spread a positive message in opposition to hate rallies, holding signs urging peace and reconciliation. They even chanted a song that called for an end to discrimination against Koreans living in Japan. I took part of this rally because we should not allow hate speeches, not only from Koreans and Chinese, but also from us Japanese. In August, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination called on Tokyo to firmly address manifestations of hate and racism, as well as incitements to racist violence and hatred during rallies. However, the ruling Liberal Democratic Party is lukewarm about legislating a law against such rallies under the pretext of the freedom of speech. The opposition Democratic Party of Japan plans to submit a bill that prohibits racial discrimination within this month. Do you know how Japan is perceived around the world? There is a strong belief we are way behind in terms of the human rights issue. While the Shinzo Abe administration drags its feet over legislating a law against racial discrimination, it plans to promptly take action to ban a textbook that says the Japanese military forced women into sex slavery during World War II. Son Jung-in, Arirang News.
now let's uh, get a check on the global headlines we're following on this Monday morning by going over to our news centre where our Eunice Kim is standing by. Hello there, Eunice. Hello, Mark. So a comprehensive report on the environment has been issued by a United Nations panel and it paints an extremely bleak picture for what's ahead in the coming decades. Uh, but it also gives some practical benchmarks on... Uh, uh, to avoid, hopefully, what uh, it says would be irreversible damage. Right, and one of those benchmarks is that the world needs to cut greenhouse gas emissions to near zero by the end of the century. It says the impact of climate change is already here, but that the worst is yet to come, including raising food shortages, flooding, and refugee crises to new heights if action is not taken quickly. Our Kim Hyun Bin reports. The United Nations climate body is warning that time is not on our side to stop soaring temperatures, making the world unlivable. Launching the latest study from the Environmental Panel on Climate Change, the UN said the world faces severe, widespread, and irreversible effects if moves are not made to completely stop using fossil fuels by 2100. It says the use of low carbon sources needs to rise from 30 percent of electricity generation now to more than 80 percent by the middle of the century to limit rising temperatures. The window of action is really closing very rapid. If you look at the total carbon budget to ensure that temperature increase by the end of this century will not exceed 2 degrees Celsius, we've already used up a substantial share of this. Scientists say a rise of 2 degrees Celsius is the level at which the dangerous impacts of climate change will be felt. But the IPCC says the world is at risk of temperatures soaring by 4.8 degrees or even higher by 2100 if things continue as they are. So this clearly shows that we have a very limited window of opportunity and I think the global community must look at these numbers and show the resolve by which we can bring about change. UN Secretary General Pan Ki-moon also stressed the need for action before it's too late. Inaction of climate action will cost much, much more. This climate action and economic growth are two sides of just one coin. The IPCC study will be the main handbook for 200 nations when they meet for a global summit on climate change in Paris late next year. China, the United States, the EU and India are the world's biggest greenhouse gas emitters. Kim Young bin Arirang News. An apparent suicide bomber detonated himself near a major border crossing connecting Pakistan and India, killing at least 45 people and wounding dozens of others. The attack happened around 6.15 p.m. local time on Sunday following a daily flag-lowering ceremony that draws hundreds of people on both sides. Pakistanis were hit with the brunt of this attack as it took place 500 meters on their side of the border. The Pakistani Taliban has claimed responsibility for the strike. Dozens of people use the Wagha crossing every day as it serves as an important trade route. Voters in two rebel-held regions of eastern Ukraine went to the polls on Sunday to choose their head of state and members of parliament. Rebel-backed polls showed that the incumbent prime ministers of Donetsk and Luhansk, a former electrician and a former Consumer Protection Agency employee, were ahead in the polls and likely to keep their posts. Moscow has said it will back the results of the vote that Ukraine's President Petro Poroshenko has dismissed as a farce conducted under the barrels of tanks and machine guns. The European Union said the elections violate a September ceasefire agreement, while Washington has also denounced the vote as illegitimate. Get connected to Korea and the world. Join us every weekday for the latest developments out of Korea, Asia, and beyond. On air, on your mobile, and online, we lead the way every day. Arirang News. To try and resolve the crisis in Ukraine, the European Union also offers 15 billion. Now, a record number of Chinese tourists visited uh, Korea last month during their week long National Day holiday, and another wave of tourists from China are expected to arrive this week after the Beijing city government unexpectedly told its citizens to take another week off. Al Kim Minji reports. 
With air pollution reaching hazardous levels in the capital, Beijing has granted its citizens a six day holiday as part of a plan to provide visitors to next week's APEC summit with some relief from the smog. Private companies will be free to use their discretion, but public organizations and schools will be shut down from November 7th to the 12th, and cars will be limited on the roads. In light of that, many citizens are planning to use the opportunity to head overseas. Tickets for flights to Korea have jumped threefold to about $1,600, and it's no different for destinations like Japan or Hong Kong. But the price hasn't put potential tourists off, with nearby overseas destinations almost fully booked. Tickets to Korea or Japan during the break have all been sold out. This mini holiday comes just a month after China's National Day holiday in early October. While many Chinese workers are looking forward to another week off, some have been critical of the government for not being able to come up with an appropriate plan for tackling the smog. Kim min Arirang News. Now, Korea is poised to have a 17th item added to UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list. It's called Nongak, and it's a type of traditional farm music that dates back to the early 20th century. Our Connie Lee reports. Drums, gongs, a parading, dancing, and acrobatic feats. It's all part of what is called Nongak. It's traditional Korean music that was originally performed by farmers in the early 1900s. Scholars say it was first introduced during the Japanese colonization of Korea. Nongak was performed in groups to encourage one another to work better in the fields and to help them overcome the difficulties of agricultural life. But today, it is a popular performing art seen all around Korea, especially during the holidays. And in the coming weeks, this art is set to be tapped as a UNESCO intangible cultural heritage. This after a UNESCO deliberative body made a unanimous decision to recommend Nongak. The unanimous recommendation is a very rare case. This is a great opportunity to share with the world the significance of Nongak. In a report on the deliberation, UNESCO says the music is characterized by vitality and creativity, providing performers and audiences with a sense of identity. The final decision will be made at the end of this month during a meeting at UNESCO's headquarters in Paris. Officials, however, say it is most likely that Nongak will be added to UNESCO's intangible cultural heritage list as Korea's 17th item. Others on the list include Korea's folk song, Arirang, and Kimjang, or the making and sharing of kimchi. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Now, Korea's favorite messaging application, Kakao Talk, is stretching out its boundaries and aiming to uh, go global, backed by some very nice new services. And its recent huge merger with Internet Portal Down. But analysts are still wondering whether this will all be enough to win over consumers outside of Korea. Our Shin Se Min has this week's industry insight. Nine out of ten smartphone users in Korea use KakaoTalk, the country's number one mobile messaging service. In Korea, you don't say, I'll text you, you say, I'll ka-talk you. But it's not stopping there. The services KakaoTalk offers are expansive and growing all the time. Users can send small amounts of money, go shopping, and even send gifts and vouchers. KakaoTalk is also able to connect small businesses with their customers. Soon, it aims to roll out features that allow users to call a taxi and control their home appliances and even help drivers find an empty parking spot. We already have a solid platform here at Kakao, but we never stop innovating, and extra features are in the works all the time. By making use of Daum's established portal, we are looking to provide more state-of-the-art services that will eventually be used in our everyday lives. Kakao Talk merged with Korea's second-largest internet portal, Daum Corporation, this year and went public last month. Town Kakao currently has a market capitalization of over 7 billion U.S. dollars, making it one of the country's largest IT firms.
Under its new slogan, Connect Everything, Town Cacao is hoping to lead the march to have everything connected to the Internet. A personalized location-based service is under development, drawing on the strength of each arm of the business. By utilizing Town's pre-existing and highly detailed map service, Cacao Talk hopes to launch a feature that notifies users when they're near a restaurant chain or clothing store they like. However, as with any company that has global aspirations, challenges lie ahead, namely convincing international consumers to make the jump to Cacao Talk. Dom Cacao missed the boat for entering the global market. Countries already have their preferred messaging services. In China, they like WeChat, Line is in Japan, and WhatsApp has a grip on the U.S. It's going to be really hard for Dom Cacao to squeeze in between. The company also has problems closer to home after Cacao Talk was rocked by a privacy scandal. A significant number of users abandoned Cacao Talk for foreign messaging applications like Germany's Telegram following the revelation that the Korean company had given prosecutors access to thousands of their users' private conversations. But it's only been a month since Daum and Cacao joined forces, and some say it's too soon to tell whether its success at home will translate into success overseas. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. And a good Monday morning to you all as we kick things off in the LPGA where Pagin B looked to hold on to her lead at the 2014 Fubon LPGA Taiwan Championship in hopes to defend her number one world ranking. Despite a great first three rounds of the event, Pagin B struggles a bit in the final round of the event but still holds on finishing off at 22 under par overall for a third LPGA title of the season. Now with the win, she holds on to her number one ranking for another week as Stacey Lewis stormed through in the final round but fell short two strokes behind the winner with Lydia Ko finishing third after shooting six under in the final round. And moving over to some Sunday's Kaylee Classic action, the Jeonbuk Hyundai Motors beat FC Seoul 1-0 as they're now one win away from winning the league title. While Busan I Park beat Sangju Sangmo 3-2 and Incheon United and Gyeongnam FC drew 1-1. And now with that, we're going to shift over to Sunday's KBL clash. The Ursan Movis Phoebus continue their hot streak, beating Incheon Etilan Elephants 80-72, while uh, Changwon LG Sakers beat the Busan KT Sonic Boom 61-56. Meanwhile, let's take a look at the highlights between the Jeonju KCC Aegis and the Seoul Samsung Thunders. Now, Samsung off to a great start in the first quarter of the game, taking a 28-17 lead before KCC rallies to cut the deficit to 47-41 going into halftime. Now, despite KCC trying to use the momentum going into the second half of the game, Samsung's Leo Lions having a monster game here, putting up 25 points and 13 rebounds. And Samsung holds on to win this game 78 to 75. And now finishing things off in domestic volleyball, let's take a look at some highlights from Sunday's V-League matches, starting off in the men's league where the Kepco Vicstorms took on the Samsung Hwanjae Blue Fangs. Now, despite Samsung Hwanjae dominating Kepco in previous seasons, this year a different story as both sides go neck and neck with the match going down to a decisive fifth set. And despite Blue Fangs' Leo Martinez putting up a game-high 45 points, Kepco's Mitar Jurich and Chung Wang Yin combine for 53 points as Kepco takes the fifth set 15 to 8 and a 3 to 2 victory. Now, meanwhile, over on the women's league, Hyundai Hill State taking on Daejeon KGC. Hyundai Hill State off to a great start here, taking the first set 25 14, but KGC, led by Joyce Gomez, the Silva's game high 33 points, take the next three sets for a three sets to one victory. And that's going to wrap it up for me. This has been SJ. Have a great rest of the day, and see you guys again for your sports needs.
Well, it feels like early winter this morning, and the cold wave advisor, as we can see, is still in place for many regions. And even if it's bright outside under lots of sunshine, temperatures will remain on the chilly side throughout the day, as the daytime high this afternoon will only get up to mid teens in many regions. So, uh, with that, here are the readings for today. Well, the low in many areas kicked off at the single digits, and the daytime high in the capital, Taegwen, Gwangju will be topping out at 14, while Busan will peak at 15 this afternoon. And on to other regions. Jeju Island and Jeju will be getting up to 15 and 13 respectively, while Tokdo sees a highs of 11. Well, it seems like the coldness should ease up a bit tomorrow afternoon. Highs will rebound to the seasonal averages, but the readings will drop again at the end of the week. That's all for now. Back to you, Mark, in the studio. Well, thank you ever so much as always, Gion, for the weather there. And that's all we have for now. We'll be back with another newscast at noon, Korea time. Until then, goodbye.